Church, also known as the shoe sometimes, and Angie says that the shoe fits, wear it. So um, <laughs> we're going to get some t-shirts printed up, and I've got a hoodie and some long sleeve tees for myself, and uh, we just had a batch printed, but I think there are several folks that said we'd love to just bring our own garment, shirt, hoodie, raincoat, whatever. So if you have a shirt, jacket, hoodie uh, that you'd like to bring, uh, just see Angie, she'll fill you in on details. 
And I'm not going to read all these announcements, but I will ask you to just uh, pay attention to those. Come to Sunday school. We're trying to kick off our Sunday school program again to this morning, first time since February or March. And uh, I thought it went pretty smooth. <laughs> now, Sharice and Angie would say different. Say amen, Sharice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they've got the little guys. But uh, we're working toward making it a smooth uh, process. And so we're trying to split our classes up where we're not as big. And uh, we still have work to do and a couple classes to add. So uh, do pay attention to the announcements. And one thing I would bring your attention to September 27th, tailgate and service. I was trying to think of the most unproper way to say outdoor service. And so uh, it was sort of, it became normal around here to just back in on our outdoor service and sit on the tailgate. So we're going to have a tailgate and service on Sunday, September 27th. So that will be outdoors and we will not have Sunday school that morning. Um, and we're trying to accommodate folks from both ends of the spectrum, the ones that want to be inside and the ones that want to be outside. So we know of no other way to do that than to do both. And um, so we think we can squeeze in one or two more outdoor services before it gets too cold and choir practice every Wednesday and be sure to check out our uh, Wednesday schedule so you know where we are and what we're doing. Uh, did anybody feel that crispiness nope. in the air this morning? Yes. 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 Let me tell you, my wife, she used to hate fall. Stand up, wave your hand, baby. <laughs> yep. She used to hate fall. She said, I hate seeing fall coming. The days are so short. It gets cool and I love hot weather. And I said, yes, and amen, until about August, and I'm ready to see fall come. But I come in Friday, you know, it was on the table. A big was a brown sugar and pumpkin spice Yankee candle. Had the whole house smelled up like fall. And uh, sure enough, it cooled off. So I'm thankful. That's a welcome change for me. And if you work outside, where's Doug? Yeah, Doug says amen. That's a welcome change. Uh, Jason, I'm sure we're glad to see some cooler temperatures. <laughs> Back there nodding your head. I hear you, man. It's good to see you. Let me pray for us and we're going to continue on with our service. Please read our announcements. Know what we're doing. If you have a question, just raise that hand to somebody and we'll help you along the way. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you and want to first and foremost declare that Jesus is Lord and that the devil is a defeated foe. And that you know where we are, you understand our context, you see the pandemic, you see the crises, you see the wars and rumors of wars. Lord, you see the earthquakes, you see pestilence coming amongst us. But Lord, it's not caught you by surprise. You're still in control, still sovereign, still on the throne, and you still called us to a mission to go. Lord, society and culture has never dictated your plan, your purpose, and your mission for your church. Today, God, I pray that you would keep us focused, corral us back in. Lord, commission us once again to go forward for the kingdom. Lord, if the world has ever needed to hear good news, it's right now. If the world has ever been at a point where they needed a savior, it's right now. Father, I pray that we would not keep our lips sealed. We would not treasure up the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in ourselves. We would not hoard that good news, but we would share it liberally and frequently in the places that we work, do business, and live. Thank you, Lord, for placing us right here at 5050 Brevard Road, Lord, for this community needs Jesus. Help us to be that city on the hill, that light in a dark world, Lord, that hospital for hope, Lord, where the sick and broken can come and be healed. Lord, where the sin sick and the dead can be made alive. Lord, I declare it to be so for Horseshoe Community so that Jesus gets the credit. We pray that we'd make much of your name today. I pray that you'd be with us and, Lord, empower us and inspire us as we sing praises to your name through song, play music for you, and preach for you. Lord, I pray that you would be in the attitude of our hearts and minds. We pray in that strong and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Do I have to ask for can you smile at me all the time? There you go. There you go. I'm kind of where Nancy was. I'm not a big fan of fall because 
everything starts to die. And I know the you know, pretty colors will leave, blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> then comes winter. But have you ever been in Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, yep. in, in January? You're not a fan of winter. So, but I've never had to work out in the elements, so I can appreciate those who do and, and like the coolness. But we do know that everything needs to die before it can be renewed. Um, the Bible teaches us that we must be dead to self to be alive in him. We know that because we have a firm foundation to, to live our lives on, and that's the word of God. So if you would stand with me, <clears throat> if you'd like to use a hymnal, we're singing number 338, the words will be up here for you. And we're going to sing how firm a foundation, verses 1 and 4, we'll do the first and last.
start doing the children's sermon again. So if all the kids that want to come up here, you guys can come up here and sit on this front row, or uh, you can, y'all can come up here too. Say, what does mustard have to do with a coloring book? Well, Doug, get ready to find out. I wanted somebody that hadn't seen this before because I've done it before, but this coloring book, and we've been, y'all did a whole series on the different <coughs> parts of the Bible. But this coloring book kindly represents a lot of what you would see in your life, in your Christian life. It's just a blank book. But, you know, you can, as you start growing as a Christian, you can take a pencil and kind of do something like that to it, and then you see you've got drawings. Like and then, as you grow a little bit more as a Christian, you take crayons, and you take these crayons, you see them, and you hit, you, you put the crayon, and the color disappears from here, but the color will actually go into here. Wow. Now, what, 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 I have, what I just did is an illusion. It's not real magic, but that's a symbol of how you grow as a Christian. You start out as a blank sheet, then you start to learn a little bit more, and you start to grow and you eventually see the whole picture. But you don't you don't want to go back to being a blank sheet. <laughs> I think you took the color right out of it. <laughs> you want to hit it and see if you can put some lines back in there? Do you think it worked? Whoa. Whoa. And you you tap and put the color back into it. Oh he's got tap on it, Cash. Look. There's the color. Oh. <laughs> But when Clint gets it, he just needs to come <laughs> yeah. All right, y'all go back to your seats. He's got some candy for you. <laughs>
everybody. Yes, my wife is a lady of many talents. Um, the Bible says when a man finds a wife, he has found a good thing. Where's my good thing? Where'd you go? Uh, she went back upstairs. Yeah, that quick. She's got to brag on her and she leaves, but yes. She is a multitasker, mother of four, Sunday school teacher, ukulele player, audio video person. So she wears many hats. I love her, appreciate her support, ministry. Couldn't do it without her. And uh, she is the best part about me. And um, anyways, Ezekiel 33, if you take your copy of God's word and uh, turn to Ezekiel chapter 33. And we are in a series simply entitled The Amazing Word of God. We're tricking our way from Genesis to Revelation in chronological order with the help of a plan from Blue Letter Bible that was printed and handed out to you in 32 of you, I think it was, or 33, said, sign me up. I'm going to take this journey with you. I hope you're still tracking along. If you are behind, and you may be, it's easy to catch up. Uh, just read in the morning and then read in the evening, and you'll be doing two days' worth, and you'll be caught up in half the time as if you did nothing. So uh, we want you to, to uh, take this journey along with us. We are getting very near to the end of the Old Testament. Israel has been... Semi-defeated, split in two kingdoms. There's now a northern kingdom, a southern kingdom. And Ezekiel 33 is the transition of the complete exile of Israel. Both kingdoms, folks are dispersed, folks are in exile, folks are in captivity, folks have been enslaved. They're no longer in the capital city of Jerusalem. There are some there, but the ones that are there think they're experiencing the favor of God. But really, God has left the city of Jerusalem and gone with his remnant into exile, into captivity. There's a sermon for you. Many times we say we're just experiencing the favor of God. Well, are we really? Or has God called us into exile and captivity where he can grow us and use us in a mighty way? So when you get to Ezekiel, there's a lot going on. Uh, many people will just uh, make it a piece of apocalyptic literature. And we'll say this is specifically about futuristic events. I think there's a here and now, and there is a to come concerning the book of Ezekiel. I believe it is prophetic in events that will come. I also believe it is a literal and historical account of a man named Ezekiel who was a prophet of God. Now, much of what Ezekiel uh, speaks, preaches, and shares with his audience is symbolic in that God shows him a vision. You remember the will and the will. You remember laying on his side. You remember doing a host of things that seem very odd to us. But God is using him and his symbolism to preach a sermon to a people that need to know about the coming Messiah whose name is Jesus, who has not been born yet. So everything in the Old Testament shoots and leads right to Jesus. We try to emphasize that here. Everything in the New Testament looks back on to Jesus who has been born. So this morning we are in Ezekiel 33. And uh, we are going to look at the first 11 verses. So if you have found your place, I pray that you have. I'd ask that you stand out of preference in reading for God's word. We'll read, if you can and if you will, uh, from Ezekiel 33, verse 1, down to verse 11. And then you can be seated, I'll pray, and we will attempt to preach this thing. Beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, that's judgment. When I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman. When he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. This guy's been warned, but he didn't heed the warning. Verse 5. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but he did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet, and the people are not warned, and the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but the blood I will require at the watchman's hand. Verse 7. God begins to speak directly to Ezekiel after he gives him an illustration of a watchman 
Verse 7, he's speaking directly to Ezekiel. Now, so you, son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die. And you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your soul. Verse 10, listen. Therefore you, O son of man, say to the people of Israel, you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine or waste away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? You may be seated. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the picture, the illustration. Thank you, dear God, for the symbolism and the account of a man named Ezekiel who was in exile with your people, who was a watchman on the wall, who warned the people of Israel that judgment is coming. Lord, who had a responsibility to share. Lord, who was faithful in doing so, and because he was faithful in warning and folks turned, you restored. Lord, that message is still the same in 2020. We are your watchmen. You have placed us on the wall around Horseshoe Community. You have placed us on the wall at our workplace. You have placed us on the wall around Ingalls. You have placed us on the wall to be a watchman. Help us, God, to warn. Help us to care. Help us to share. Lord, that lives would not be destroyed, but that lives would be saved. That the wicked would not perish, but that the wicked would turn and have eternal life. God, today I pray, speak and challenge us in a mighty way. Challenge us in a new way. Prick our hearts, soften our hearts, replace that hard mess with a heart of flesh. God, give us a heart for the lost. Give us a heart for the wicked. Give us compassion for those that are on their way to a devil's hell that goes there unwanted. God, I pray today we would sound the alarm and we would warn those in our circles. We love you. We do it so that Jesus would get credit for it. We understand only he can save. Lord, we understand when he stretched his arm and said it is finished. That's what he meant. It's done. The work is complete. The forgiveness is waiting. The gift is in your hands. All we have to do is reach and grab it. God, today I pray we would share that good news that we are sinners, we need a Savior, and He came and He died for us so that we can live. Today, I pray, change hearts, change lives, save souls, make disciples that we could go forward with your gospel and make a difference in a lost and dying and dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. April 18th, 1775. The British troops were approaching Boston. Mr. Longfellow wrote a poem concerning the man we're going to talk about briefly. One by land, two by sea. How does it, how does it start? Listen, my child, and you will hear the midnight ride of... Paul Revere was a watchman, a warner. You do understand that in the battlefield, in engagement of conflict, the goal is to get information about the enemy. 
We need information before the enemy gets here. It's why the United States of America has trillions of us, trillions of dollars invested in technology so that we know the steps of our enemy before they land here. It's the same reason why Paul Revere said, hey, let's hang one, if they're coming by land, two by sea, and I'm going to ride from Boston to Lexington around Concord, and I'm going to warn that the red coats are coming, the red coats are coming, the red coats are coming. Do you know why he warned about the red coats coming? He was a the warner. enemy approaching? He was a warner. He was a warner. He cared. He had compassion for his colonists. He wanted to save them from the hand and the plan of the enemy. And here's what Paul Revere didn't do that we often do because we also have an enemy who is approaching and encroaching in our territory and he's coming to kill, to steal, and to devour. He wants nothing more than to destroy your life and here's what the church by and large is doing. Mm. Red coats. Red coats are coming. I think the red coats might be on the way. And here's what our warning sounds like many times. Silence. And the silence is deafening. And it's what an unbelieving world, C.S. Lewis said, this is what an unbelieving world finds simply. Unbelievable. Now Ezekiel was a watchman on the wall who would have a horn. And as he was alert and awake, not sitting on his haunches, not yawning, not half in and half out, not lethargic and unconcerned, but a man of compassion, as Ezekiel was given this vision from God of a watchman on the wall who was alert and who was faithful and whose eyes are fixed on the horizon, his job was to raise the horn, the trumpet, and God says, blow the trumpet. And I hope I can make this thing sound the way it's supposed to sound, but it would. And why would he sound that alarm? Why would he let his countrymen know that the enemy is coming? Because he had compassion and he cared. He was a watchman on the wall. And just as Revere would say, the red coats are coming, the red coats are coming. Do you think he wasted time riding? Do you think his voice was lowered? Do you think he was lethargic in his message of, the red coats are coming. <laughs> How did he want? The red coats are coming. The enemies, no, no. And we're in a real battle against a real enemy and our battle is not against our brother, not against flesh and blood, but it is against principalities and powers of darkness and wickedness in high places. And the evil one is out to say, you're okay, just keep doing what you're doing. It's fine, just so long as you're sincere. I mean, just believe something. We're all going to the same place anyway. There is no faith of a believer that is different than an unbeliever. Jesus is not the only way. That's closed mind, old traditionalism. Just believe something. I mean, just go to church once a year. Just do something. Put a five in the plate. It's all good. But that's not what God told Ezekiel to share. He said, you are just like that watchman that I told you about. And if you... Do not sound the alarm. They're going to die in their own sin. You're not, you're not going to be judged for their sin, but I will hold you responsible for their death. Well, how could God say that? The same reason he says before he ascends into heaven. One word, two letters. Go. Well, go and do what, Jesus? Go and preach the gospel. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But it's dangerous out there. I told you I was sending you out like sheep amongst wolves. Get after it. They're going to be nipping at your heels. They're going to be talking about you. They're going to be after you. They're not going to like you. You won't be welcomed. 
But he never promised those things. He just said, go. Just like he told Ezekiel, be on the wall. Be alert. Be on the lookout. Because if you don't warn those in your circle of influence, I'm going to hold you responsible. Now, preacher, that's not popular preaching. It sure ain't. But since when did Jesus care about popularity? Well, what's that got to do with me, preacher? The title of my sermon. You're a watchman, too. You're a watchman, too. I'm a watchman. You're a watchman. God has placed us in our specific context. I say it, I hope I don't say it so often that it just numbs you, but we're here on 5050 Brevard Road for a reason. God's placed this church here as a strategic piece of his plan. And do you understand without the mortar <coughs> on the wall, without the watchman, the city lies defenseless? Without the watchman, the enemy can come in and plunder? And God has placed us here for right now. And you say, well, that's old and Paul Revere. You don't even know how much of that's true. Well, maybe not, but I can tell you a true testimony of a pastor that you probably all know by the name of Charles Stanley. Many people know Dr. Chuck. We had a family visit here a couple weeks ago that remembers it, First Baptist Atlanta. I said, oh, you got to there with Charles. Here's what Charles Stanley said. I heard it come from his mouth, a sermon I listened to. He said, and he was preaching an evangelistic sermon, which is what I'm going to give you this morning. He said for days, weeks even, he would ride by and his neighbor three doors down on the other side of the street would be out cutting his grass. And every time he seen him, he said he felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, Charles, you need to stop and share with that brother. Charles, you need to stop and share with that guy. Charles, you need to engage him in conversation. Charles, you need to get to know that guy. Charles, you need to share me with him. Charles, you need to tell him about the good news. Charles, you need to stop. Charles, 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 Charles for months. And one day as he was riding by that fellow's house, fellow was pushing his lawnmower and he collapsed behind his lawnmower. When Charles Stanley, of course, throws his car in park, runs across the guy's lawn, picks him up and holds him in his hand, and there's no pulse. And there in his arms lay the man that God had put on his heart. Time and time and time and time and time again to say, share Jesus, share the good news, tell him how he can be saved, find out if he's a believer. And here Charles Stanley with no inkling of an idea that the man ever heard the gospel before, ever heard the name of Jesus, ever made a decision for Christ. Here he lay dead in his arms. And at that point, it's too late to sound the alarm. It's too late to yell, the red coats are coming. You see, it's good news, but it's only good news if it gets there on time. Jesus is a righteous judge, and he's coming back not as a suffering servant to say, oh, it's okay. He's coming back to judge and to rule and to reign. And when he gets here, it's going to be too late to say, have you ever heard about a man named Jesus who can change your life? And there are people in your circle and in my circle. One of mine is on the door back there. His name is Bob. And I've had conversation after conversation with that brother and tried to share Jesus with him. And, and by all measures, he's a good guy. Would give you the shirt off of his back. Has helped me and my family tremendously. He's never robbed a bank, never killed anyone. He's a good American citizen, but he's lost and on his way to hell. And this, those people that I care about and that you should care about that are in our circles that we should be intentionally pursuing with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because why? Because you're a watchman too. The watchman must warn. I spent too much time. That was just my introduction, Miss Judy. That wasn't even my first point. <laughs> I'm on a bad roll today. The watchman must warn. You say, well, preacher, what's the significance of a watchman on the wall? Every Jew who had ever lived in a wall city knew exactly where a watchman was. Every Jew ever lived in a walled city knew exactly what a watchman was. God does not speak in hieroglyphics. God is not playing some eternal game of hide and go seek from you. God knows the context that you live in. He knows what the people are exposed to. He knows how to reach those people when he says, here's an illustration, like a watchman on the wall. Why did he say that? Because these Jews knew what a watchman was. 
Why do we do things like bouncy houses and slip and slides and those things to reach a community? That's what we do. People know those things. And he says to Ezekiel, use this watchman illustration. And as a matter of fact, you are a watchman yourself because the watchman is critical for the city's defense and the city's survival. And when he sounded the alarm, whenever he would grab that shofar, that trumpet, and blast it, it was loud, it was clear, it was unmistakable, it was a cry, it was a plea, it was an appeal, it was compelling. It made people stop in their tracks, examine their station in life, and turn and change direction when he sounded the alarm. So push pause on Ezekiel, let's just get real 2020 in your face. Let's just get in your business. When is the last time you saw the enemy approaching your family, your friends, your co-workers, or the people you do business with? That sounded the alarm. Well, there's no enemy approaching people in my circle because I just surround myself with good people. I review last week, liar, liar, pants on fire. You know, the ones who the enemy of addiction is creeping up on uh, the ones who the enemy of lust is creeping up on the one who the enemy of infidelity and in their marriage is creeping up on and adultery is creeping up on the ones whose gluttony is creeping up on the ones that gossip and tail bearing is creeping up on you know that enemy that crashes at the door is ready to steal and kill from you and devour you and make you lose your joy and steal your shout that enemy you see it Surrounding and encroaching on the people in your circle, and we do not sound the alarm. There's a real enemy. A real enemy, and it's our duty to sound the alarm. Now, let's just push pause, and I'm not talking about out of pride, and I'm not trying to guilt anyone into doing anything, but I'm talking about compassion. Let me read this. Jeff will be familiar with this guy. Penn and Teller's magician show. Anybody in the house know Penn and Teller? Nope. Real big, tall dude, real short, small guy. I've shared this one time before. Jeff's heard it. Penn Gillette, who is the talkative half of Penn and Teller's magic show, committee performance, wrote this in 2008, and I've held on to it for all these years, and I hold on to it every time. Here's what he says, and I don't want to bore you by reading, but listen. At the end of the show, as I've mentioned before, we go out and we talk to folks, you know, sign an occasional autograph and shake hands and so on. And there was one guy waiting over to the side. And he walked over to me and said, I was here last night at the show and I saw the show and I liked the show. He was very complimentary about my use of language and complimentary about honesty and stuff. He said nice stuff. Hear how many times he said nice? And then he said, I brought this for you. And he handed me a Gideon Pocket Edition. I thought it said from the New Testament, but also Psalms is from the New Testament, right? Mm -hmm. I'm quoting Penn. A little book. And he said, I wrote in the front of it, and I wanted you to have this. I'm kind of proselytizing. And then he said, I'm a businessman. I'm sane. I'm not crazy. And he looked me right in the eye and did all of this, and it was really wonderful. I believe he knew that I was an atheist, but he was not defensive. And he looked me right in the eyes and he was truly complimentary. It, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And, uh, and, uh, and I've always said that I don't respect people who don't proselytize. This is coming from an atheist. Now tune in, lean in, pay attention. Penn, an outspoken atheist, said, I do not respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and hell and that people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, well, it's not really worth telling them because it would make it socially awkward. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? These are his words. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? How much do you have to hate someone, he says? I mean, if I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, but that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. And I've always thought, and I've written about that, and I've thought 
a bit conceptually. This is coming from the mouth of an atheist. This guy was a really good guy. He was polite and honest and sane, and he cared enough about me to proselytize and give me a Bible, which he had written in a little note to me, just like, like your show and so on, and then like five phone numbers for him and an email address if I wanted to get in touch. Now, I know that there's no God, and one polite person living his life right doesn't change that. But I'll tell you, he was a very, very, very good man. And that's really important. Do you see what he didn't do? He did not say there was a man standing on a street corner beating him in the head with a Bible telling him, you're going to hell. That's the right message, but the wrong method. Did you hear how many times he said the man was nice, the man was polite, the man was genuine, the man cared, the man was compassionate, the man was complimentary? How do you win people to Jesus? Not by beating them up with the Bible. You embrace that brother or sister and you say, hey man, how was your work day? How was school today? And you begin to find common ground and you say, I like the way you do X, Y, Z. And you transition that into a gospel conversation. You see, what struck Penn as odd is that this man really believed, really cared, and was really honest with him and said, I believe there's a heaven and a hell. And I believe by your statement of being an atheist, you're headed to hell, and I care about that. In other words, exactly what Penn said, there's a dump truck headed for you. It's bearing down on you, and I'm tackling you, trying to get you out of the way. I'm warning. I'm sounding the alarm. I'm blasting the trumpet. I'm saying the red coats are coming. Why? Because you're a watchman too. So we are, should be compelled to warn. Isaiah would say it this way in chapter 56 about a watchman who does not warn. He says he's like a man that can't see. Who's going to put a blind man on the wall around your city to protect your city and warn you when the enemy's coming? Not going to do it. No, Ross bro. I ain't either. We ain't going to put a blind man on the wall that can't see the enemy coming. That's stupid. He says it's like a blind man that can't see. He says it's like a dog that can't bark. How many people y'all have a guard dog that can't bark? That's stupid. Again, sin will make you stupid. Who's going to put a narcolap on the wall? He also, Isaiah says, people that can't stay awake. Who's going to put someone who cannot keep their eyes open on the wall to stay alert and faithful to warn the people of the enemy coming? Nobody. That's why Isaiah says in chapter 56, you need somebody who's faithful, who's attentive, a believer. Someone who knows the truth and is willing to warn others about the truth. Because if the watchman was alert and faithful and the people obedient, lives would be saved. If the watchman was careless, lethargic, lives would be lost. Now, I used to write CNC programs way back in the day when I was in college, and there was this thing called if and then logic, if logic. There was G codes and M codes, and occasionally there would be an AND gate. And an AND gate would tie line one to line two so that the program and the tool would know the correct machine path to take. God uses that same logic. If the watchman warns, and there's that AND gate, and the people heed, then, if and then, if the watchman is faithful and he warns, and the people heed it, not just hear it, but heed it, that is obey it, then they will live. Again, the watchman not responsible for the sins of the people, but he is responsible to warn the people in their sin. Y'all got that? The watchman is not being judged for the person's sin, but he is being judged for not warning the person in their sin. Here's the problem, and here are the scary stats in 2020, 47%, 47% of evangelicals born between 1980 and the year 2000, those would be millennials, to which I'm in that generation, 47% of millennials say it is wrong to share their faith with anybody. 47% of evangelical, those are born again believers by their statement, say it's wrong to share their faith with someone else for this reason. The concern of being judgmental. Let me just break it to y'all real quick and easy. We're called to make judgment calls. You make them every day. Well, that's not right. You just made one. 
We are called to judge. We do not judge hearts, but we do judge sin. And adultery is always wrong. Stealing is always wrong. Killing is always wrong. Homosexuality, always wrong. All of these things, always wrong. Always wrong. We make those judgment calls. And nobody runs that hogwash out to its end if there is no absolute truth or people be running stop signs and stop lights and they would go to a different house every day and they'd lay down with a different woman every day and they'd go home to different kids every day and they'd go to a different job. So that's a bunch of mess that there's no absolute truth. There is absolute truth. And we as believers are called to be messengers of truth which says that we're making a judgment call. Now there's a right way to do that. I read that to you. We enjoyed your show. You did a great job. I believe there's a heaven and a hell. Here, I want you to have this Bible. I've even put my information in there personally. If you would like to contact me, please do. That's compassion. That's care. Not, again, standing up blasting them about how great you are and how terrible they are. That's not how you win people. But we do have to make judgment calls that when almost 50% of people in my generation say it's wrong to share your faith for the concern of being judgmental, when do you build a bridge and get over yourself about the conversation being socially awkward and you come across as judgmental to deliver truth to a person that's on their way to a devil's hell? When does that become secondary and tertiary issue? When does that become not the main point but to tell them about Jesus? Because again, you're a watchman too and it's only good news if it gets there on time. The first thing I did, the first thing, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, no pun intended. The first thing I did when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ was I called my friend Bob. Nancy, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I called him. I said, come to my house for supper tomorrow night. He said, I'll be there. And me and this boy had been to many bars together. We had done a lot of crazy things together. We had been in some really awkward places together, party together, fished together, hunted together. I was with Bob more than I was with my biological brother. We were closer than me and my brother are. As a matter of fact, Bob knew more about me, the real me, than my family knew about me. And at age 29, when God saved me, I said, I've got to tell him. And I had him to my house. We broke bread, and Nancy, what did I do? I told him what God had done for me. And leaned on the hood of his truck, just like this. I can see his face right now. It's as sure as my name's Clint. He said, that's good. He said, I need to do the same thing. I said, well, do it. I ain't ready. Got his truck and left. I've sounded the alarm. I've warned him. I told him the good news. I told him, I said, man, if he can save me, he can save you. I mean, you've been in church like three times your entire life. I went three times a week and was still a hell you. And he still saved me. He can save you. And it's the compassion that drives that, that we've got to have that watchman mentality of these people are in my circle of influence. It's my responsibility to tell them about Jesus. The watchman must warn. Do you remember that if and then logic? But the wicked must, must turn. The first component was the watchman's responsibility. The second is the wicked responsibility. And again, he could have blew his horn, his trumpet, his shofar. We can cry loud and spare none. Paul Revere could have screamed the red coats were coming to his blue in the face, passed out, fell off his horse, and was drugged behind his horse out of town, and if they did not heed the warning, he's done all he can do. You are in the same boat. When you share Jesus and share him truly and share him prayerfully, at that point, you've done all you can do. You've shared, you've sown, and that's not a one-time occurrence. That's a lifestyle. Every time I talk to Bob, I try to transition that conversation. And every time we have a good conversation until I start talking about Jesus. And before you know it, it's like, oh, somebody's beeping in. Hold on a minute, I gotta catch up. Let me call you right back. Click, click. And I get it. I get it. I believe he's under conviction. I believe God's gonna save him. But it's my responsibility, I believe, to warn him and to share with him and to tell him because I love him and I've spent many days with him. And I want him to understand that God can save him too. It's not because I came from the right side of the track, born in the right family, I had the right pedigree. It's because God saved me because he sent his only son. And the ground is level at the cross. And no matter what family you come from and what your background is and what your sin is and what you've been into, he can save you. And we sound the alarm, but the wicked must turn. I mean, you see it here. And there's a difference between hearing and heeding. Even James says if 
we get in the perfect law of liberty and it does not change our behavior. It's like looking into a, a mirror with a dirty face and walking away from it. You've changed nothing by the understanding that your face is dirty. It's when your faith produces action and when your belief spills in other people's lives and they begin to say, I, I want what Denise has got. I, I want what Jeff's got. I mean, I remember when he would pull you over and punch you out. I, I want what he's got because God has changed that man. I, I want what Big Terry's got. I want what Larry's got. I want that in my life. I want that peace. I want that compassion. I want to care about people like he cares about people because right now I just see bodies. I mean, I don't really care about the person. And folks are looking and Jesus will make you very attractive and appealing. And then you can share. And the Holy Spirit does the changing. You're not responsible for the results. Do you see that in Ezekiel? You're not responsible for the results. You're responsible to share. Responsible to blow. Responsible to warn. Responsible to love. Responsible to be compassionate. Responsible to be complimentary. Responsible to give Jesus. But the results are up to him. Because if I could take Bob and put him in a corner and shake him. And make him say, yes, I would. That's not my job. That's God's business. I work in the Holy Spirit. You're a faithful watchman. Share, share, share. The watchman must warn. The wicked must turn. The last thing the Lord will say. Now, draw your attention here. It's 1158. Two minutes till Standard Baptist time says I'm done. But I'm not a job. I'm going to be about five minutes after you. All right, Ezekiel 33, verse 10, and we're going to land this plane. Therefore, you old son of man, say to the house of Israel, you say, if our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we waste away in them. And that's exactly right. Israel says to Ezekiel, we're in our sins. The burden of our sin is weighing us down. Anybody ever read Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan? The weight of my sin is weighing me down. It's a burden that I can't bear. And you're exactly right. You cannot carry that burden. Only Jesus can. And the people of Israel say, if we live in our sin, if we're burdened by our sins and it's bearing down on us, it's more than we can hold, we will die. Well, and then what I said, we will die if we waste away in them. And then I circled this in my Bible. They ask a question. How then can we live? If we're buried under our sin, how then can we live? Do you know what the world in your walled city is asking that you're the watchman on the wall, they're asking that question. How then can I live? How then can I come out from under the burden of this divorce? How then can I come out from under the burden of lying? How then can I come out from under the burden of whatever their pet sin is? And you're the watchman on the wall warning that the enemy's coming. And you're asking how you can live. And God responds, as he always does. Listen, verse 11. As I live, says the Lord God, and he does. I have no pleasure. Listen to me. Listen to me, folks. Listen. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He does not say, I have no pleasure in the death of the righteous. Because most of us would consider ourselves fairly righteous. I mean, we are as church. I know it's 12 o'clock. Y'all would consider yourself fairly righteous, wouldn't you? He says, he says, God says, the living God says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Do you know who the wicked is? Bob. The wicked are those people in your life that God has placed you in. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but this, 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 but that the wicked would turn from their way and live. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. I don't want the sinner to die. I don't want the pedophile to die. I don't want the rapist to die. I don't want the addict to die. I don't want the liar to die. I don't want him, her, you to die. I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And that was me before 2012. And he says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But listen. Turn from your evil ways. Turn from your evil ways. And then God asked a question. For why should you die? O house of Israel. Do you hear what God's doing? He's giving an invitation. You're asking me how then can you live? I'm asking you why would you die? 
I've made a way where there was no way. I've brought you out of the land of Egypt. I've placed you in the promised land. I've raised up judges. I've raised up kings. I have now sent prophets. Ezekiel is one of those. I have bankrupt heaven. I have sent my only son. My only son has given you everything he could give you, his very life. He died for you. You ask, how then can I live? I ask you, why would you die if there is a way of salvation? Why would you die? God says, I, I, I don't want the wicked to die. Turn. Do you see how many times he said, turn, 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 turn from your ways. Why would you die when you can live? And that is the question we must pose to the people that are in our walled cities. And our walled cities are our places of influence, our places where we work, play, and do business. We should be asking the question, why would you die when you can live? The watchman must war. The wicked must turn. And when they do, the Lord will save. It's really a simple message that we find from old to new, from start to finish, from Genesis to Revelation. And you say, what's the invitation to every reader? Because you have got red in the face, you're sweating a little bit, you've been awfully loud, and you blew that crazy horn. Here's the invitation. Here's the invitation in all seriousness. We've got 40-some names around that door. One of them's mine. He's my one. His name is Bob. One is my wife's one. Her name is Angel. One is Connie's one. His name is Bone. One is Jason's one. There's a Brandon. There's a Carl. There's all sorts of names around that door as you exit today. I want to remind you that God cares about the one. He says there's rejoicing in heaven over one soul that comes to repentance. One soul. So you say, preacher, it's kind of like politics and it's kind of like other things. There's so much wrong. Where do I begin? I mean, I don't even know where to start. Start with one. I've identified my one. I pray that you've identified the one in your life. Today, the invitation is this. You come and you pray for your one. Pray for the person in your circle. I didn't say pray for the county of Henderson. I didn't say pray for the community of Horseshoe. I didn't say pray for the church of Horseshoe. I said come and pray for the one person that God has put a bullseye on in your life that you believe he can save and he needs to save. You come and pray for that person today and leave them at the feet of Jesus and then you make it your life's goal from this day forward to share, to warn, to blow the trumpet, to share Jesus with that person if you believe he can save you. If you believe he will save you. Well, preacher, I don't like that kind of invitation. You're guilting me in. I'm not guilting you into anything. I'm trying to bring out some compassion in your heart for a lost soul that's headed to a devil's hell. Today, I want to invite you on the invitation. Come. Leave that soul with Jesus. If you would like a Who's Your One card, Nancy can get those out of my desk, top desk drawer. we got to stack that thick. You feel more than happy to fill out Who's Your One, tear the tab off, stick it to our door, drop it in the bucket. We'll pray for that soul. We believe God can save them. Today, maybe you say, man, you, you stirred up in me. I never heard anything like that before. I mean, I just thought it was all, everything's good. Everybody's okay. Just as long as I go to work, pay my bills, keep my nose clean, it's all good. No, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. There's no other way. The way. And without a relationship with Jesus, you'll never get to the Father who is in heaven. Well, what does that look like, preacher? That means you believe what he says is true. You believe that he came for sinners like you and me. That he died so that you could live. That he resurrected so that you could have new life here on earth and have life eternal in the future. Well, preacher, that sounds far-fetched. <laughs> so far-fetched they strung Jesus on a tree between heaven and earth, stripped his clothes, plucked his beard, and spit on it. Is, uh, it does sound a little far-fetched, but it's true. So today, I'm inviting you, bring your one and leave it at the feet of Jesus. Maybe you're the one, and you say, man, you're preaching to me. You've been reading mail that's delivered to me. You don't know me, but you have read my mail today. You come talk to me. God wants to save you today. Or maybe you say, man, I believe what's going on here. I love it. I want to join arm in arm in this church. Move forward for the kingdom and horseshoe community. Today, come talk to me. I can tell you what church membership looks like here and how we handle that. So if you'd rise to your feet, bow your heads. And close your eyes. It's an invitation. It's five minutes after 12. The crock pot is set. It ain't going to burn. 
The Methodists are already at the buffet, the ones that are open. There will be more fried chicken when you get there. Eternity hangs in the balance for some folks this morning. I'm telling you, there's people in your life that you can make a difference in by sharing Jesus Christ with. I'm inviting you to come. Pray for that soul. Pray for that couple. Pray for that one in your life that God has put on your heart and your mind. See a bullseye on them, not to shoot them down, but to lift them up and tell them about the good news of Jesus. Today is your day. As the music plays and the singers sing, you move as the Lord leads and you see fit. If you want to come and tell me, hey, I need to know that Jesus. Today, come talk to me. I'm not going to embarrass you. We'll talk. I want you to get some satisfaction. You move as the Lord leads and as the music plays. Thank you, sir. If you would like one of those, Ed has some. As you're leaving today, you want to take one home and fill it out. Bring it back. We'll plop it on our door. We'll make that a target of our prayer. We've already pulled two or three off of that door facing where we've seen God radically save someone. Take their name off. Take it to them and say, hey, you are my one. We had a church praying for you. We we're praying God would save you, and he did. So I hope today has not been a, man, Y'all need to get him some medication. He's fired up today. Uh, I get fairly passionate when we talk about people's lives hanging in the balance for eternity. And uh, eternity is a long time to be wrong. And so we want our friends, our families, our neighbors, we want to be responsible watchmen and blow the horn so that their blood is not on our hands. We want to make sure they've heard the good news and we want to make sure it gets there in time. So I love you, church. Thank you for being patient with me today. Thank you for participating. Don't forget Sunday school again next Sunday, 10 a.m. Jake Wilson, I love you. Let's go dig your crop pot. You're dismissed. <laughs>
Sunday after church, we'll get Miss Judy and we'll sing it a couple times with Miss Judy. And we'll go downstairs and we'll practice.